Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. My colleague is JP Mason. We are on ourselves. We don't have a secret guest sitting in the sidelines called Henrik or anything like that, unfortunately, JP. But hopefully we'll have a few of Vim Janssen's uh, double winners back on the side in the coming weeks. Now, I'll tell you something. What a weekend that was, right? <laughs> <laughs> Aye. As, as weekends go, uh, that was a good one. That was so was really good, good by the way. So good. My weekend started on Thursday, JP, right? Because you know me well enough. All morning I'm preparing for our big interview with Vcorst and Reaper, right? Um, who were superb. They were absolutely brilliant. I've watched it back because I just thought they were so, so good, right? And then after that, I'm thinking, right, what's next? And then I'm at Gracie's with Tom Boyd on the Friday night. So I'm, I'm, I'm tuning into that. And then as soon as that's done, even driving home in the car from Glasgow, I'm thinking Martin O'Neill Saturday night. Now, this is where we need to dig into this story because obviously you were there. Uh, it was great to see you across that room chewing the fat with Martin O'Neill. <laughs> and uh, the, the big beaming smile on your face. Not only that, you've got Martin O'Neill, you're holding court with Martin O'Neill and Las Vegas. <laughs> I mean, how serial was that? Yeah. I well, I mean, I, I'm by the way, I've just name dropped about half a dozen people, and I make no I apologies for doing that, right? No apologies. I'm loath, to, I'm loath to, to say this, but yeah, I have uh, been pals with Las Vegas since before they were signed, since before the, the you know the whole um, explosion in 2008, I think it was. I just went to see them supporting a band at Cabaret Voltaire, and there was about 20 people there. And I was writing for the magazine that I wrote for at the time, Is This Music? And uh, they came on. Like I said, there was only about 20 folk there. And they just blew me away. And I, I, I went up to them at the bar afterwards, like uh, uh, James's sister, Denise, who still manages them, um, and his stepdad, Dean, and went up and said, look, I thought that was amazing. I'm writing a review. I don't know how I'm going to get past you guys to get to the headliner. I mean, obviously, I had to write about the headliner as well. Mm. But I wrote a fairly effusive review about Las Vegas in which I predicted that they would play the Barrowland. I was like, that they're 100% going to play the Barrowland. If I don't hear this song in the Barrowland, then I'm not worth anything. And uh, and it happened. And and I was you know privy to a lot of early gigs they played. I actually was at the same gig as Kev Graham in Stirling. And we spoke about it on Saturday with them. Mm. And we remembered that it was at Fubar in mm -hmm. Stirling. Which isn't really even a gig venue, it's more of a club. Uh, um, yeah, because take that played the FUBA. I didn't know that. <laughs> they did. Take that no, played no. the FUBA. I wasn't at no. that gig, by the way. I wasn't well, at that one. Well, Kevin and I were independently at that gig, uh, as we were both on a, the same bus to Amsterdam for the Ajax game in 2001. That's why. It's quite weird how our paths didn't obviously cross at that point until years later. But, but yeah, it was great to see uh, uh, James and Rab. There on Saturday, and they've they they go back with Martin and Neil. Like James played in a charity game at Celtic mm. Park, and Martin and Neil was his manager. So he's got a great story about sitting on the team bus oh, going to Celtic brilliant. Park. That was I think he was sitting in John Robertson's seat or something like that. I can't yeah. remember the exact detail of it, but yeah, it was great to see them, and and, and obviously to get a bit of chat with Martin and Neil was completely wild. Um, that was amazing. About music. Talking about music with him as well, which is something I'm a wee glass of wine. You and him sharing a wee glass. Of, oh, <laughs> love that. Uh, it's, I mean, honestly, I, it was great to tell him as well how um, he changed my mum's opinion of Celtic mm. almost single handedly. My mum, mm. prior to Martin O'Neill, my mum was always very anti me going out in a Celtic top, um, me going to the games even. And then I, I took her to her first game under Martin O'Neill, the, the Bordeaux game. And we spoke about that. I said, remember last lands go? And he, he said, oh, yeah, I can't forget that. Because remember last lands scored right at the right at the death to beat us. Didn't Maravchuk score a free kick that night? He did, he did didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I remember. We got to, me and my mum got to experience that. I just told her, told him how she loved him uh, mm. as, as, a, as a guy. You know, she just was completely enamoured with his persona and... She loved Didi Agat as well. And he went, wasn't Didi Agat fantastic for us? Wasn't it? I mean, for whatever we paid for him. And I was like, I to think Alex McLeish could have, could have kept him at Hibs, but he didn't sell out the money. That's um, right. That's right. What did we get him for? Something like 60 grand, something like that. 80 grand. 30. 
That is bizarre. That is yeah. bizarre. That's like Magnus Hedman's weekly wage. Have we got yeah. uh, my gat? And there was so so much to talk about. I mean, a few people have asked, when is this interview going to be on the channel? Um, unfortunately, we didn't film it. So there's a, a few reasons for that. One of the reasons, JP, with these live events is that you want the, the individual to open up. You want them to be honest, sometimes brutal. And you certainly don't want that to be captured on film. You just want them to open up and be comfortable that whatever they're saying is not going to be in uh, a red top the following day, uh, getting clicks here, there and everywhere. So we do ask people in the audience not to film stuff, you know, um, and that's why we don't film it either. But some of, the, some of the insight was just tremendous. I mean, at the end of the night, we talk about uh, a Q&A. So basically anybody in the audience who's got a question they think I should have asked and I've not asked it, then they can tweet the question, they can write it down. And we ask all the the, the best questions or the ones that we, we get time to, to ask at the end of the night. And someone was asking about some of the players that he missed out on. JP, and he was talking about Rivaldo and they mentioned De La Pena. And he couldn't remember De La Pena. <laughs> who came over and played a couple of trial games for us? Couldn't remember him. Well, and by the way, his yeah. memory is brilliant. It, it's spot I know. on. It, yeah. de it definitely is because I, I brought up uh, obviously Stuart Braithwaite, who, who you interviewed um, mm. for his book. I no, I'm not long just finished that book, and in the book, it mentions how Martin O'Neill came backstage at a Mogwai gig in London because I think Stuart knows his daughter Alana, mm -hmm. and Alana got her dad into Mogwai. <laughs> Brilliant. And then uh, I brought it up and I said, oh, you, 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 I read Stuart's book. And he went, he went, yes. And he went, and his uh, his wife, she's involved in the music business as well. And said, I, uh, they're not actually together anymore. They're both remarried, both happy, all pals. It's all good. And he went, really? That's wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and he remembered you. He remembered you. Because he's, he's a man. From, yeah. from the hydro gig. Yeah. I mean, I, I did tell him a Seville story. So it was that, I mean, it is quite a, uh, a random uh, and detailed story. So, and he brought his wife over to hear it as well when I met him at the at the Radisson after the hydro event. So, ach, it was just great to 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 be there. And it, I tell you what, he didn't hold back on some of the players. I mean, he obviously has a lot of affection for them, but you know, Petrov got it tight, Hartson got it tight, Jonathan um, Guild, <laughs> Jonathan Guild, aye. Um, it would be interesting. Chris to see Sutton got it tight as well, to be fair. I, all, all night, Chris Sutton got it tight. But I think, <clears throat> obviously, Martin and Neil, all jokes aside, I think he totally admits how big a deal the Sutton signing was. And he, did he not say that if we hadn't if we if we hadn't got Sutton at that time, and we'd maybe signed them like a month later or something, we might not have won the league. Yeah, he said because he, I think he was talking about some of the guys that came in a wee bit later, like Tomo and Lenny and stuff like that. And he said, you know, if that was the situation with Sutton, it would have been a different ball game. A um, couple of wee things. Why are we talking about Martin? Well, I believe he set us on our way to that tagline. Now, that's a quote. That's not me being elitist or any of these things that we, we don't really um, associate with having a Celtic state of mind. This is Celtic, according to St Ange. Um, biggest budget, biggest fan base, biggest club has the penny dropped. It's starting to drop, I think, all around Scottish football as the latest cup win reverberates both through the media and through our biggest challengers, Rangers fan base. Um, and I believe that, yeah, you can go back to Fergus McCann, absolutely saved the club built the stadium, we stopped to 10. And we've been talking about that over the last few weeks. But in terms of domination, JP, and I've said this many, many times and I opened up on Saturday night by saying this, I believe it's Martin O'Neill that gave us our, our pride back as a football club. You look at the 23 years since he became the manager and we've won 36 trophies. You look at the 23 years prior to him arriving at Celtic Park and we won 15. So 36 versus 15. And, you know, him as humble as ever says, well, I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't accountable for many of those. You can't take, but what I was trying to say was, you know, that the sea mindset. change of domination, the mindset, the culture, all this kind of stuff. Uh, no, and it, no, uh, um, you know, the, we, we were called, you know, entitled. I don't think it's entitled. I think it's expectant. Um, you, there's an expectancy from the fan base that you've got to you've got to win the league. You've got to win these trophies. And that's the reason we're running with the tagline, and we'll come back to that as well. One final story for, from the evening, uh, which I loved. And, and the fact that it was the night before and all that as well, JP, you know, there was a feeling on my way home, driving home, me and the missus thinking, wow, the fourth part of a massive weekend is about to come up tomorrow. 
And I've not really had time to zone into the cup final until I woke up the following day. And I said that on the on the uh, post match and the pre match. But he, he was talking about. Um, I, I read his book, and by the way, anybody out there who's not read it, it's phenomenal. One of the best football autobiographies I've ever read. He wrote it longhand, and then gave it to the the, the publishers to deal with. He wrote it pen and paper. And by the way, I remember uh, an interview I read with. Uh, Alex Ferguson, whose first autobiography, the right big thick volume, he did the exact same. JP he wrote it all down and just gave people the notes. So I deal with that, you know, and whatever they need to do to get it into a processor, they've had to, to do honest, it. That doesn't surprise me because uh, is it not? I mean, I know this is a very very short form version of it, but with his team talks, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, when he when he announced the team, he would just come into the dressing room with a bit of paper. And, he'd, and it wasn't all fancy or anything like that. He would just come in with a bit of paper and read out the theme, maybe, what, <laughs> an hour before kickoff or something like that. Yeah. Could just to keep players on their toes and everything else. And mm. uh, I think it was McGeady talked about that in one of his interviews um, when, he, when, he, when, he, when he got his debut at uh, Tynecastle. That's how he yeah. found out. It was just Martin Neal just walked in and read out the team off a, off a bit of scrap paper. <laughs> and, the, the Listen, this is a story for Brian, and when, the next time Brian's on, he can tell it himself, but it involves Sean Maloney, because uh, we were oh. talking about <laughs> we were, one of the funniest bits of the night. We were talking about uh, the kind of youth that was coming through. There was quite a few players, like McGeady, like you say. Um, Jamie Smith was part of that, wasn't he? Liam Miller. Uh, good crop of youth coming through. Ross Wallace played a lot of games. Um and we were trying to say, well, you've got a crop of youngsters coming through. And also we were looking at a different, another batch of signings in the mold of Sutton and, and Thompson and Hartson and Lennon. And he says, well, that was that was a stickly bit because the club weren't really wanting to spend that money again. But mm -hmm. um, we were talking about McGeady and I said to him, you know, when he when he came on, he burst on the scene. And everybody mentions that AC Milan game, don't they? Uh, where, where he was brilliant. And he burst on the scene and, and Martin O'Neill said, you know, he should have, he should have, achieved even more as a footballer. So this is a, a guy who's won almost 100 caps for Ireland, um, numerous trophies, big transfers to Russia and, and Everton and all this. But when he was like, you know, as a youngster, what he had as a youngster, he could have got even more at the game. Um, so all that is, I love all that. That is absolutely meat and drink for me. I love it. But he was telling a wee story. Uh, and the reason I mentioned his book is because obviously the first part of that's all about um, moving over from the north of Ireland and signing for Nottingham Forest and that incredible journey he went on with Brian Clough. And he says that there was a time, they were interested in Neil Lennon, right? But Neil Lennon had, uh, sorry, Crew Alexandra had agreed with Coventry, JP, that they were going to sell Neil Lennon to Coventry. And the Coventry manager at the time was Ron Atkinson, right? So maybe Strachan would have been playing at the time, perhaps, before he took over as player manager. Maybe. Because um, I think he played under Ron. I'd need to check that. So, I remember him from a sticker album, actually. Yeah, aye. <laughs> aye, aye. I know, eh? You knew all the players for all the teams when you collect stickers. And uh, as they're driving to go to Southport, it was, right? Which is near Manchester, right? I think it's in Greater Manchester, Southport. I, I think so, yeah. No, wait a minute. Is it Southport? Or is it? Whatever Southport might be in Liverpool, somebody in the the uh, comments will tell us. And they're going to go to Lenny's apartment, who he's sharing with some other player. And uh, they're talking in the car, him and uh, John Robertson. And Rob Robertson says to him, he goes, "Can you remember the story that Brian Clough and Peter Taylor told us about that player that they went to sign, and he wasn't keen on signing? So they they basically made a decision that they weren't going to leave the house until he signed, even if it meant staying overnight. And they stayed overnight and signed the player because that's the kind of thing Brian Clough would do." And O'Neill was like, oh, I do remember that, right? So they made a decision in the drive to Neil Lennon's apartment. We are not leaving until he signs, right? Because he had a, the, the agreement was there. He just hadn't signed for Coventry. He was going to go and sign in the morning. And when they went in the, and they, they actually looked around the state of the place, Martin O'Neill called his apartment a hovel, right? <laughs> he, said, he said, even the rats were refusing to eat the cheese. <laughs> And, and O'Neill quickly decided he was going to sleep in the car if necessary. But Neil Lennon agreed to sign for Leicester and the rest the less, of the CSS. For less money. For less for money. Less money. money. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that, that's the kind of night that you're in for if you ever get a chance to go and listen to uh, Martin O'Neill. A great Celtic manager. Um, and we're going to be talking about another great Celtic manager in Ange Postacoglu. JP, uh, Sunday. Tell us from your own perspective about Sunday and then we'll start. Um, getting stuck into some of the things that have happened since. 
Well, I surprisingly can remember it all because I wasn't really participating in uh, the usual beverages that you would uh, consume on the uh, cup final day. I just, I had, I had, I had a shift the next day. I was paranoid about it because I was like, I don't want to feel rough for this shift. Turns out the gig got cancelled because the band got stuck at Heathrow. So I didn't even have the gig on Monday to worry about. But uh, I started out, just went to the, went out to the ground and uh, met a couple of folk on the way in that I knew, my mate Steph. It's good to see him. I've not seen him for a while. And, uh, and a guy in the queue when I was when I was going in, I was in, uh, uh, what was I? I was in K2. And I met a guy, Ross, who watches watches the show. He said you need to mention me on on Thursday. So uh, hope yeah, you yeah. enjoyed. He, hope you enjoyed the day, Ross. And he successfully managed to get his uh, hip flask in, which was a gift to him. He was he, as we were as we were approaching the gates. He was like, "Is this airport security? We're going through here because I want to get this hip flask in. I don't want to get it confiscated." And then lo and behold, they got in with it. So um, I'm sure he enjoyed the game uh, more than most with his. Uh, these hip flash, but I no the guy a guy two seats along from me, and I got my ticket in the ballot, so I wasn't sitting with anybody that I knew, but there was a guy two seats along from me and he said and he kept saying it and he was like, This is our day. This is our day. And he just kept saying it. And I, I well, right fast forward through the game, at the end of the game I reached over to him and grabbed his hand and I was like I was pointed to the ground and went, This is our day and he just like grabbed me and hugged me and but the, the game itself was uh, I mean, we started we started well and then obviously we got the goal at a, a, a really good time. And somebody's pointed out, watched a lot, consumed a lot of media this week on both sides for 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 entertainment purposes. And uh, I, I, although I don't leave comments weirdly enough, that I, I I find that a little bit weird when folk leave mad comments on Rangers podcasts. I just I just like to watch from afar and just take in take in the pain. Um, but um, I noticed somebody said, I don't know if it was a Celtic one, that said that the time that we score the most is just before half time, between the 40th and the 45th minute. It's almost like it's timed, mm. you know, rather than it being, I'm sure we would much rather have scored earlier, but to get that goal just before half time really, really knocked the stuffing out of them because I think they knew that they had the mountain to climb and then the atmosphere at half time with that. Celtic Glasgow chant that the whole place sang for the whole of half time. It was brilliant, mm-hmm. really, really great uh, to 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 be a part of that. And I, I I don't I've not watched it back, but I hope it came across as loud as it was in the ground on the TV because it was like it was incessant. It was one of those ones where you're just like, this is going to this is going to run now for the whole the whole of half time. I think it's just you can tell what everybody <laughs> was like. Uh, this could be good if we kept this going as, as halftime entertainment, and, and it did. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was it was it was a brilliant atmosphere. Kind of, um, it's kind of weird being in the daytime. I don't know why. I just I'm used to cup finals getting dark. Like it's, I remember the, obviously the last one we played against them. It became dark, but it was just Hamden in the sun, mm-hmm. and I was thinking of all sorts of memories from the past of. Um, Thinking back to my first experience of seeing Celtic was on the TV with my dad in the '88 Cup final, and I was just thinking of, like, thinking of Tommy Burns quite a lot actually. Just mm-hmm. thinking how much it meant, to, how much Celtic meant to him, and and then you look around the stadium, and there's the lucky people that were there to to witness this. Something that doesn't come around that often: a cup final against Rangers, any Rangers, and uh, it was just. It was amazing to be there. So 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 glad that I got that I got a ticket and um, yeah. Oh, well, there was a bit of a whitey, as everybody's pointed out. There was about a 10, 15 minute spell where we didn't seem to be able to find a man. Yeah, Greg Miller was misplacing passes. Callum McGregor was misplacing passes. It was almost like we were opening the door for them to to score another one. Um, I did laugh at Morelos' celebration, though. I mean, you would thought that I'd put them in the lead rather than bring them mm-hmm. within a goal. And I know what he was trying to do, obviously rail the, rail the crowd up and everything else, but even some of them have admitted that watching that celebration was a bit embarrassing and they also didn't think that they had another goal in them and it was far more likely that we would score another goal, especially with the quality of the substitutions we were bringing on because 
we all knew how strong a squad is, and then you see it in glorious technical or when players like Haksibanovic are coming on who should have scored. Yeah. Matt really <laughs> could have or should have scored. Um, and we could have made it a, a, a far better, uh, a far more distant or clear scoreline than it was. But um, just a, a great day all in. And I, I've, I've a very, very stark reminder of the difference in quality between the two sides. It's something that we had to listen to last week. Mm-hmm. I mean, whether or not those words were put in Sakala's mouth, I don't know. I, either way, they went out there. They were broadcast. It wasn't in a foreign magazine or paper where it was mistranslated. It was, <laughs> it was in front of the Scottish media. And I think a lot of them are even like, God, why did he say that? You know, if you're going to say that, you need to back it up. You can't. And then he misses a sitter. Yeah, like, and, um, and it was a sitter. Oh, oh yeah. Definitely. Massive, massive you, miss. You would, been, you would have been screaming at one of our players if they'd missed it, but fortunately one of our players wasn't in the press during the week saying that they were the bigger, better club with the better fans and um, calling them the other mob and all that. It's just like, really, really, really weird behaviour from somebody. And I'm sure a lot of their fans, maybe even some of his, play, his teammates must have been like, why have you said that? Yeah. <laughs> why? <laughs> Well, that, that's the thing you would expect from the likes of Callum McGregor. We're going to come back to him at some point during the show, JP, because I just think that there's a, you know, there's something to be said in terms of the, a core of the Celtic team. And I've always believed this, be it traditionalism or whatever it might be, sentimentality to a degree, but they've obviously got to be able to play. But the core group of a Celtic team uh, being from the... The, the Celtic um, Academy, probably, coming through the ranks, um, or someone who's maybe been there for a long time having come to Celtic like Scott Brown, so that they understand the, the absolute fabric of what the club's all about and um, what the state of mind's all about, what the culture is, so that if anybody um, deviates from that, then it won't take long for them to be put right by someone within the dressing room. And I think and hope that that would happen at Celtic. Now, the biggest issue... I think we had when everything was falling to bits in the final season uh, under Neil Lennon was that we felt, you know, there was some bad apples or bad eggs in the in the dressing room and the culture wasn't quite right. And I think one of the biggest achievements uh, that Ange has had, as well as his success with the trophies and the style of play and the recruitment, is the fact that he's managed to mould that culture at Celtic where, you know, we go about our business. That That's a big, bold statement that's in the tagline there and that came from Ange. But generally, no wonder you know, week on week on week, getting asked the same daft questions in press conferences that he thinks, you know, I'm just going to put this right. And he set the narrative as well. And that we're going to speak about that. He set the narrative on his own future. A couple of things you mentioned there. That was an incredible spectacle at halftime, right? And I've been reading this week about particular journalists in the Scottish media who criticise the Celtic fans without even mentioning that. They criticised them for the fireworks and the pyro, and they didn't mention the fact that they created such a positive spectacle at halftime well, and throughout the game. I have to say on that note, that is the first time that I've been at a game where I've heard audibly that song, the ABBA song, and I'm sorry if anybody is watching this who thinks they can put forward an argument to justify singing that song, no. then I'd quite like to have a a calm and measured uh, discussion with you about that and your rationale for that being acceptable at a game involving Celtic Football Club because I think it's an indication of the lack of interest in that song that although it was audible, it was audible from maybe let's let's be let's overcompensate and say it was a thousand people. Right? Mm. Let's say there was a thousand people out of the twenty thousand that were singing that song. So obviously you could hear it. There was no hiding from it. But it wasn't joined in by the majority of the support in the same way that the whole Celtic end sang Celtic Glasgow for half for the halftime uh, duration. You didn't get a, an uptake on that song, and there's a reason for that. Is because most of the people that were there were probably very uncomfortable with the fact mm. that it was sang. Um, I think it's abhorrent. I've never really spoken about it with much uh, vigor before because. I've not been at a game when it's been sang. I know that it, I think it made an appearance at Dingwall away. Um, I wasn't at that particular one, but I was there on Sunday and I just thought, nah, I'm I'm really, really completely off the bus 
with this nice. uh, with this song and do not want really to be involved with it, associated with it because it just doesn't it doesn't chime with everything that we are talking about, everything that that tagline yeah. says, everything that we talk about every week. Um, it's just a Celtic real, state of mind. Yeah. For me, it doesn't fit. It does no, not fit. It doesn't. And but then there's the, the people that sing it. Uh, and a guy walked past me on his own singing it outside the ground loudly and looking around as if to be like, look at me, I can sing this song. I just kind of, I saw that nobody was joining in. And so it, it, it kind of looked a bit stupid, to be honest. But then he would probably come at me and be like, ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, F you, you're not a real Celtic fan. Like they're, they're scumbags. We can sing what we want about them, but I'm sorry, we can't really. Like it's, no, it's no. It, it, not 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 something like that. There's plenty of other songs we can sing, slagging them off, laughing at them, all sorts of stuff. Like, I mean, I was waiting for a a big chorus of "Who's the champions now?" Scum, who's the champions now? You know that like that's getting it right up them. It's an old day. It's a good day. Uh, People might think you, you shouldn't be calling them scum, but it's 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 jovial as opposed to anything. There's nothing jovial about reveling in people's deaths, no. and and that's ultimately what you're doing by singing that song. So uh, I'm by no means a, 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 a voice of anybody. I'm just giving you my opinion on that song, and would encourage anybody that is going to continue singing that song to have a think about it. And, and ask yourself if it is with keeping within the traditions of the club that we all love and support. And regardless of age or anything else, I don't care if it's people that are half my age that are singing it. Um, and if they think that, oh, I'm old and past it or whatever for, for, for thinking that, it's just, it's just not it's just not acceptable. And would, would, what would Jock Steen think about that? So ask yourself that as well. I agree 100% with what you've said, JP. I'd be amazed if anyone who tunes into a Celtic state of mind would disagree with it. Um, and I know, I, I can actually speak for the Axom group of contributors to say that Axom's take on it uh, to a man and women is that it's completely unacceptable. It's toe curling when you hear it. Um, and I know it's sometimes deemed coming across as pious or sanctimonious or whatever, but I remember... I don't want to be like that. I don't no, want to I know. be like that. I'm, I'm, I, I, I was talking about it to a friend and they were like, well, you better mention that on, on the show on Thursday. And I was like, well, yeah, of course I will. But I, I, again, it's like you said, you don't want to come across as being someone that's like shaking a fist and, you know, like a, an old man coming out of the, the, the house to tell the kids to stop playing my football out, out the front of his house or something like that. That's kind of what you feel like. But at the same time, you know, why why wouldn't I talk about it? I, am I just going to ignore it and pretend I didn't hear it and pretend that I don't have an opinion on it? Because I do, and that's it. So <laughs> there you go. The thing is, so, JP, if you, if you speak your own truth, then you can do it and you can do it with confidence because... <laughs> Then, if someone questions you, it's your truth. You're not you're not doing it as part of a crowd. It's your own belief system that's that's resulted in you having this opinion. And I remember at the beginning of the season, uh, being at Celtic Park trackside. I mean, listen, right? Anybody in the comment section, I would love to hear if you wouldn't do this. You get invited along to Celtic Park to stand trackside with a league trophy, right, and talk about Celtic's prospects under Ange this season. Okay, it's going to be broadcast on the telly. That comes secondary to me. JP, right? Because I'm mid forties. I don't care about all that kind of stuff in terms of image and everything else, right? And so I do it. Of course I do it. I mean, you're walking through the front door of Celtic Park. You've got the league, the real league trophy, not a fake one, with the ribbons on it, and they're asking you to wax lyrical about Ange Postecoglou. And that's exactly what I did. But I remember that night reading one particular comment. It didn't rankle me, but it, it stayed with me. And it was, look at this weapon. The only time he's ever been at Celtic Park or the only time he's going to be at Celtic Park this season. That type of attitude, that type of person is the same person who's at the game singing a song, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think I don't think it is representative of the wider fan base, JP. It's not the wider fan base sang You'll Never Walk Alone, sang the Celtic Glasgow chant, sang uh, you know, that created the, the colourful atmosphere. I mean the the, the, the obviously the there's some people that sang that song that were maybe responsible for the, the, the TIFO. I hope not. But the TIFO was brilliant. You know, it was really, really uh, great to turn around and suddenly see it just come from nowhere like a phoenix 
and with the, the flames and the and the flares, what was going on at the other end? I've absolutely no idea. Um, Do you ever know? Do you ever, yeah, ever know? It's just yeah, to figure that out. It was, it was another uh, catchphrase moment. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know what was going on there, and uh, I and, and just there's just so much. There's so much good about the Celtic support. People that I don't know, people you meet. There's so much good about us. So why let a a a, a, a song like that um, drag us down to let's face it, a really a gutter level? I, I just like I, I don't I don't think it's it's appropriate and it detracts from all the good that went on on Sunday. That we're we're bringing that up and people will be like, oh, well, don't talk about it then. It's like, well, so is that how things work then? You just don't talk about the negativity or things that have rankled you. Um, at a game because you've got, you've got to call it out. You've got to call it out. Right, totally. You've got to JP. You you also mentioned Tommy Burns there, um, talking about memories and Scottish Cups. So when you're watching with your old fella back in '88, um, and it's funny because I remember watching the, the, the footage similarly to yourself, watching the footage and Tommy Burns was sitting down on the grass and he had the the Nike football boots with a yellow uh, swoosh. Right, mm-hmm. which were pretty big in the, the kind of late eighties, and he's sitting there with it, and it was the actually base, you know, a big, big, heavy base of the Scottish Cup with the, with the wood and all the different wee plaques with all the names on it and all the rest of it, um, and he was sitting there with the with the base. It was, I remember that stuck in my mind, and I later found out that uh, McAvenny went over and they're celebrating, and then Neely Mockin went over because he had to get the base, and Neely mm-hmm. was the type of guy that just you know had to get the job done and. And he's trying to get the bass off Tommy, and Tommy's greeting, and he's like, "Come on, Tommy, give me the bass, give me the bass." He's gone, but you didn't understand, Neely. They'll be talking about us in a hundred years. He kept and saying that. Tommy Burns kept saying that to Neely Mockin. because he obviously says that to Jim White. The whole interview with Jim White. Jim White weirdly has his hand. If you watch it back, Jim White has his hand on Tommy Burns' shoulder for the entire interview. So he's obviously he's got the mic. Aye, you're and not going anywhere. <laughs> And he's got his hand, and you're like, "Why have you?" Put your-? I've never ever seen that in any other interview where uh, an interviewer has got his hand on the shoulder of the player he's interviewing, and he says, "Oh, you you get to celebrate tonight, then, or something." And Tommy Burns goes, "Oh, don't you worry about that, Jim." And as the camera pans away and fades out, you hear him going, "You can buy me a pint if you want, or you can buy me a drink if you want." And- that's a brilliant interview. He, he, he name checks some wee guy he had gone to visit oh, that oh, week oh, in the hospital. Yeah, oh, and then. Oh, oh. There you go, they're there and they're always there, that famous quote. Special, special moments, like you say, and that's what you want to remember about cup finals. Now, leading up to that, as usual, you've got all the mischief makers, many of which are in the, in the press. Um, you're a braver man than me because I don't I don't have a look at any uh, Rangers outlets whatsoever, uh, JP, other than the mainstream media in Scotland ones, which obviously are kind of like that anyway. And... All the chat around, you know, Anne's doing this, Anne's doing that. You had the comment from the Australian journalist saying that, you know, he's he's a shoo for Leeds and all this nonsense. And then when Ange makes a comment about it, they're not satisfied with what he said. Ah, oh, you know, it, it wasn't definitive enough. And he comes out and he makes the comments, which I absolutely love during the week, basically saying, you, you know, you might be surprised how long I'm here. You know, he's building something really, really special. Um, and you hope that at that point, they put a, they put a sock in it, JP, and they try and concentrate on what Andrew's building rather than concentrating on his next move away from the club, because that that dominated a massive part of the build up to this game. Mm. Or oh, the the link, links for him going away and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. I, I actually, as as the penny, as you say, is dropping with them, and they're all starting to realise that we are not far away from the so called. Uh, most successful club in the world title that they cling on to, um, i.e. if we win the next two trophies that are on offer this season, we only need two more and we're ahead of them. And that that title is gone. Uh, and then we're only, what, two away from 55, the magical 55. <laughs> um, that- when, did, when did the 55 thing become a thing, though? It was because they wanted to... Amalgamate two trophy sets of trophy wins, and, and they wanted to underline two sets of trophy wins. That's when fifty five became a thing. Join the dots, basically. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to yeah. Join the dots, and also that it's I don't know is is it the most amount of league titles that someone that anyone's won in the world? I don't know. I, I don't pay attention to the detail of that, but I think that 
in the same way that Sir Alex Ferguson, when he came into Man United and his ambition was to knock Liverpool off the perch and win more than them, I think that that might be in the back of Ange Postacoglu's mind as his legacy, potentially, at Celtic, is to walk away, drop the mic and be like, remember that? Remember all that crap you were talking about being the most successful club? Who's the most successful club now? If you want to, because he's all about numbers and trophies. He, he's said that since he came in. He's been judged and measured on his success in previous clubs on the trophies and the, the mm-hmm. things that he's won. So you can tell there's a ruthlessness and a hunger about him to win as much as possible. And if as a result of that, he can walk away and say, well, Celtic are now the most successful team in Scotland. And it's a fact. I mean, that is a hundred percent. Charlie Miller's already on record as saying that it can happen and all this sort of stuff. And their fans as well are, are definitely fearful of it happening and having this 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 thing taken away from them. So I do wonder if 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 by that veiled threat from Ange Postacoglu is that he does want to get past, equal it, get past it, and put some distance between it. Before he before he goes away, and the way that we're going about our business right now, they have to acknowledge that this is no lucky Celtic team. No. This is no flash in the pan. We're going to sell all our players. They're all they all want to leave. <laughs> they all want to stay. <laughs> like I I don't really get the. I mean, yeah, of course, there's probably going to be one or two that will go in the summer, maybe three or four. But we've seen the way that he's gone about his business in the last two years that, okay, Juranovic wants to go and try his luck in Berlin. Cool, we'll just get Alistair Johnston from Canada, who nobody's heard of, who becomes a name that is linked with Celtic just as the World Cup is kicking off. So you think that deal's probably been done before the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And then Alistair Johnston comes in, plays like he does on Sunday, and you're not even batting an eyelid towards Juranovic. You're, no. you're just thinking, this guy is fully committed, doesn't want to get beat, in Rangers players' faces. I mean, looking at him, when you just see him in the new Celtic gear that's been advertised, the 90s stuff, um, which is horrendously overpriced, by the way. I mean, £100. Yeah, absolutely. Wild. But, mm-hmm. um, you see him, those pictures of me, he just kind of looks like a wee guy for a film. Like, like you know, like <laughs> somebody who's super bad or something like that. Do you know, it, it doesn't look like he's going to be a menace in any way, but put a football strip on him and a pair of boots and stick him on a pitch, he's a bit of an animal. Like There's a nastiness about him. I like see, it. The way he shrugged off Barisic going down that touchline after, I think, winning the ball pretty well from somebody else. And just the way that he was like, in Cholak's face as well, like just taking absolutely no nonsense from any of them. I mean, and it's from a right back as well. There's something really great about a right back being that into it. Same as Lustig. Remember how Lustig used to, well, Lustig was, instead of being nasty, was more just up for a laugh and would just laugh in players. Rubbing their nose, exactly. Yeah. Um, but but nose Johnston, Johnston has that about him. And uh, uh, my friend met him on Sunday and uh, had a chat with him and she was like, oh, you'd, you'd really like him. He's 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 really enthusiastic. Like, he talks a lot. He's not one of these guys that's, like, aloof and, oh, I'm a football player and I don't give it, don't give too much away. Apparently, he's, like, really sound in, uh, in person as well. So We went, you yeah, mentioned, much. you mentioned Lustig there. I think mm. we went through a, a, a series of right-backs uh, after Lustig left the, the club because we didn't have that ability to see that there was an issue in the right-back position and address it before Lustig left. And when he did leave, you've got to look at the the experience that left the building as well. International, um, Champions League experience, you know, successful team experience. You know, being in a club, uh, being at a club that's winning trophies and knows how to get things over the line in terms of league campaigns. And we lost a lot when Lustig left the building. Um, And it's it's only now you look back, you think, you know, it took us a long time to replace him. And, and I've already listed all the right-backs we went through before. We found out that Tony Ralston was still in the building and he could do a job. And then mm. we bring in Juranovic and then we bring in Johnson. So we end up having, for a short spell, three really, really capable right-backs. But right now, you're looking at Johnson thinking, you know, the number two shorts are his. They're not going to get lost anytime soon. Um, and by the way, I think that with regards to the comments, it's not going to be a case of us becoming arrogant 
an elitist and triumphalist and all that kind of stuff with these comments. It's just about setting the record straight here. And if you look at trophy wins from the 50s in the decades, from the 50s right up to the present day, you can write off the 50s, even though we had some really good victories, the 7-1 Hamden in the Sun game that you've already mentioned, a double in 54, the Coronation Cup. Other than that, Rangers dominated the 50s. Celtic dominated every other decade except the 90s. Mm. And that's a fact, you know. So a lot of their trophy haul was back back in the day, JP. Which, was done, in an over, which was done in an overdraft that I saw a clip of uh, Sir David Murray saying recently, that he would rather Rangers won things, won trophies and titles with an overdraft than not have an overdraft and win nothing. That's what he said. And that ultimately is what led to the the, the catastrophe that took place. Well, some would call it a, a, a catastrophe. Um, others would use other <laughs> superlatives to describe what happened in 2012 um, to them. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's it's just it's, it's madness. And it just shows that Guys our age who support their club, their entire childhood and teens mm. were built on uh, almost like a false narrative, a, 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 an, em an emptiness. Yeah. I don't really know how you could... Well, I mean, obviously they'll look back on those days fondly because they're not going to have days like that again, I don't think. No, I mean, they won't. I, I really don't think they're going to ever get back to... And, and, I mean, unless some maniac comes in with... Uh, you know, billions of, of, of pounds or even multi millions. Uh, and we've seen the type of people that have gone near them in the past, in the recent past. Uh, they've not been the most uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> trustworthy of people that have, uh, have gone near them with, with suitcases of money. So I, 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 just, I just think, even I even heard one of them say that they're sick of talking about 55. Sick of talking about 55. Which is all we got rammed up as for an entire summer and following year, and even to a certain extent still now. Mm -hmm. But I think that they're actually realising that there's been nothing since then, really. Like a, a, lo a lonely Scottish Cup is all that's come since then, and no real title challenge to us, and no progression. No How many progression. players that played in that 2019 Cup final were playing on Sunday? How many that, are still involved? I, I was think surprised. That's the other frightening thing for them is the realisation that their their squad development and their squad progression has been horrendous. Mm -hmm. And whereas and they're contrasting it to us and going, oh my God, look what they've done. Look look how they've managed to get rid of players that don't want to be there and get money for them and use that money wisely to then buy in a Rayo Hitati or a, a Kyogo Furuhashi. But the, the smart ones amongst them are, are realising that we haven't just gone out, opened the checkbook and signed all these players having not balanced the books and sold players to, to, to pay for those players. It's uh, it's delightful, really, to see. It, it is. It's, it's, it's someone, someone's walked into most of their rooms and turned on the big light. They've been sitting with a candle burning or a wee like, <laughs> lamp by the side of their, their <coughs> sofa. Someone's just walked in and went, there's the big light on. Like, Here's what you've been missing in the bigger picture of all of this. That's what's that's what's happening. There's a realization, JP. And and by the way, you've also got to say that this 55 thing, right? So I, I said at the beginning of the show there, since Martin O'Neill came in in 2000, we've won 36 trophies. By the way, that was 36 before Sunday because that was on my notes. So it's 37, right? Uh, another quadruple treble, and we're we're just about hitting 55. And that's just since O'Neill walked in the door. So your 55 is obsolete. Um, you then talk about world's most successful club. What a nonsense that is. I mean, that's like saying a goal against St Mirren is the same as a European Cup final goal against Inter Milan. That's a nonsense, right? Real Madrid are the most successful football club in the world. <laughs> no one can argue <laughs> the toss. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't think they're going to get overtaken anytime soon. Absolutely not. Um, I'm keen to bring in because JP and I, uh, we didn't really have a chance to get the normal catch-up last week because Morton Vikorst and uh, Mark Reaper were in the room. So it was understandable. That was before Reaper nipped away up the Alps for a bit of skiing. By the way, I found that, right? See, see when I was a wee guy, but around about this time, my next-door neighbour knew a photographer for one of the Red Tops and I got a, a wallet full of like original... Original pictures. They're and I forgot I had these, right? So I need to get that 
and you signed, get a signed and framed man, like for yeah. a frame. I, I, what I do have signed is a George Cadetti. Uh, it's it's in red pen just there. You can you can barely see. Did you get that done at the time, JP? Ah, that's done at the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. brilliant. And last is one is, is that I'm kissing the badge there just before he goes <laughs> back to Portugal. Yeah, and the la- <laughs> last one I'll show you is Big Pierre scoring the oh, goal against the Erdry. Oh, what a- you know what? I've got the program through there for that game. And when I'm talking about great games in my Celtic supporting life, I always mention that. And it was a rubbish game to watch, JP. But see, yeah. in terms of its importance, it was huge. Yeah. It was massive. Ninth minute cross came in for Tosh McKinley header and we win the 95 cup final Joe Hamilton good afternoon to you uh, Logie, uh the usual regulars coming in which is great to see Urban Culture good day fellow Axom addicts I just listened to yesterday's show brilliant stuff but we have not been able to comment yes after the event but you can still stick a wee comment underneath we read them in the morning as well um, so that we can uh, filter out any abuse <laughs> and also respond to people that watch regularly Paddy has JP been ah. able to get rid of the smell no. <laughs> from doing last week's show <laughs> It no, was probably it's, no, it was great, JP. You know, it's a permanent it affliction now. I, I just have to I have to deal with it. And even if I'm having a really, really uh shan day, uh, I, I think of that and I think, wow, I mean that it really was something else. It's just I it was just, just really great to be able to speak to two people who've given you and to be able to thank them as well. I, I, at one point I said after I was describing their my mine and Michael's uh, drunken train journey back to Edinburgh, I was like we had a really great night, and that was thanks to thanks to you guys, you know. For <laughs> but the line, the line of the day was: you didn't sign a three-year contract; you signed a lifetime's contract. That was brilliant, and that was I off told, the cuff. I took I was off the cuff, and I told that to Martin O'Neill on Saturday that I'd said that to them because I was telling them that we'd interviewed mm-hmm. them on the show, and, and he was asking after them. He's like, "Wait, where are they nowadays? What they do?" And he didn't he didn't know, so I was telling them about that, and and then I said uh, about how. Um, Mark Reaper was going skiing in Austria and I said to him, I was like, guarantee you'll get stopped by somebody looking for a selfie or just for a chat or whatever because they are so, there's all, there's always a Celtic fan somewhere. Um, it just, it's, it's, it's a fact of life. I mean, I, I got a, a picture sent to me uh, from uh, a girl I know who was in Brazil and she was sitting down for breakfast in a hotel in Brazil and there's a guy sitting in a Celtic strip in Brazil, Sao Paulo, and I'm like, Get a picture. I'm like, no way, <laughs> absolutely no way. So I and then I told them that I'd said that line, and Martin O'Neill was like, "It's very true, it's very true." Um, <laughs> you, you do, you do, you do sign a lifetime deal because if you're associated with Celtic, even if you're negatively associated associated with Celtic, like see, like guys that we remember from. Imagine Ireland. we bumped into Marvin Compare if we were on holiday in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I maybe draw the line at that. I mean. But I'm talking about guys like, I don't know, guys like Stuart Slater and uh, other players, like even Mowbray before he became the manager. Mowbray wasn't at Celtic at a successful time, but you would, no. if you saw Mowbray, you know, before he was a Celtic manager, I mean, even now as a Celtic manager, I would still want to have a chat with Tony Mowbray. I know he wanted to do his best for the club. There's no two, no two ways about that. It just didn't, sometimes things don't work out. But I love Tony Mowbray at Celtic. That was one of my Paul biggest. Elliott. Imagine we oh, met Paul I Elliott. I know. Ah, Paul Elliott. Did he even win a trophy with Celtic? No. Did he win? No. no. There you no. go. He got, ah, six, I mean... he got 16 yellow cards in his first season, though. <laughs> ah. 16 yellow cards. I mean, listen, the, the, the stories are tremendous, and people, I hope, realise that when I'm uh, sitting there on a Thursday morning preparing for a chat with JP Mason, Martin Vicos, and Matt Reaper, I'm an excited wee laddie. I'm that guy that had the photos getting programs and stuff signed, JP. That's me. And But the, the thing is, with regards to that, I'm so focused on getting prepared for the interview itself that you can't allow these thoughts to come into your mind. So and you just let me do that. <laughs> you let me take that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that. <laughs> they, loved it. they loved the enthusiasm. I could tell it was coming through uh, loud and clear. Sean McGee, afternoon troops, what a weekend that was. Martin O'Neill Saturday and the hoops getting to set this, the standard on Sunday. Well, I hope you enjoyed Saturday, Sean. It was a fantastic evening. And even though I knew what the number 31 actually meant to Martin O'Neill because he has since told the story, I told him the old story about Rafael from Brazil. Oh, yeah. You mentioned Brazil. And I don't know if, if, if he was 
just appearing to be surprised, but he said he had never heard that that theory around the fact that Raphael had the squad number number thirty one, and there was this awesome. rumor flying about that he was like, "He's I'm going to play for Celtic before he does. You better give me his number." But obviously, yeah. the the number thirty one goes way back to his European Cup winning days, um, and it was just a number underneath the European Cup that he was presented with from the Forest. A small one, wasn't it? A small one, eh? Yeah. Uh, he said, had that not happened, he would have taken it off Raphael when he seen him in <laughs> training for the first time. Was, yeah, was he going to the game? By the way, was Martin O'Neill going to the game? He was going back down south. There was something else he was doing on the Sunday, so he was oh, going right. to miss the game. Um, hail, hail. Good evening from the Great Southern in West Australia. Always brilliant to hear from our fans over in Australia. Bizarrely enough, JP, I was sent a picture this morning from uh, Dan Orlowitz, the, the, the journalist over in Japan. He, he's gone into a shop in Tokyo and my book's sitting on the shelf. Superb. Oh, that from him, yeah. Oh, that was from Dan, aye. Superb. Music chat, yes, we do like a wee bit of that from time to time. And uh, Juan Douglas, what a training top. That takes us on to the 90s. There's been a few wee um, uh, tipping the, 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 the toe into the water into the 90s today, JP. I remember them so, so well. And as soon as you came on earlier on, I says, wow, you know, that's a proper throwback to the 90s, which it was. Celtic at that time, obviously, the long-standing deal that we had with Umbro, but this week, you've already mentioned that there's been a, a kind of retro range uh, going back to the 90s that has been launched by Adidas. Now, anyone who listens to the show regularly will know that, obviously, and I don't mean to put you know ram this down anybody's throat, I released the book recently on Celtic jerseys because I love the Celtic jersey. I love the history of it. I always wanted Celtic to be with Adidas. There's the book right there. There you go. Nice coffee table book. And if you think uh, I'm rubbish at writing, you can look at the pictures because the photography is tremendous. And yeah. I always wanted us to go with Adidas. You know, that that's my point, JP. Umbro, we were there for years, 70 year association with Umbro. We then move on to Nike, of course, and, and we, we spent some time uh, with New Balance. Eventually, we come into uh, a deal with Adidas. And I'm looking back to some of the old kits, you know, uh, the Marseille kit with the three. Adidas stripes up here, the white and the blue, and then the, the reverse of that beautiful kit. Um, and then you think of the the Netherlands when they won Euro '88 with that um, chevron mm. kind of design, and I'm thinking, yeah. oh, these things would make amazing Celtic kits. But they've obviously went back and they've done the whole retro thing, and uh, they released it this week. You've already mentioned that the pricing seems very steep indeed, doesn't it? Especially when we've already got a couple of ranges out there already. Aye, and also especially given that no one's really flush with cash at the moment um, as well. I, like £50 for a pair of shorts is also a bit wild. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I think it's, I don't know if it's more uh, aimed at kind of like, I don't know, more like sort of like folk in the cut about in Shoreditch and Hoxton and Lund, you know, like that kind of, like there was a thing recently where, I, I don't know if it was before we signed um, our Japanese players, but there was some sort of music video where someone was wearing like a retro Celtic top, and it was a Japanese music video. Right. And it, and it was like a baggy. They were wearing like a baggy Celtic top. I, th I can't remember which one it was, but I don't know. It just it. I don't know if you're going to see the the the, the usual people <laughs> wearing this this gear. I think it's more. It, it's very hipstery. Do you know, Hank? Like the whole idea of it. Like I've seen, they've done it with Arsenal. We saw Kieran Tierney posing in in a strip. Um, this is similar to the Celtic one that they've created, but it's just yeah. very, very basic. It's got the Adidas equipment badge, um, the Arsenal uh, gun, and then the stripes up the side. But I don't remember Adidas ever having stripes down here as as a thing. It was always a shoulder. Thought, yeah, but... maybe maybe training gear. I th I'm thinking back. Maybe there was some Arsenal training gear actually with the three, but they weren't situated the way that they are on the Celtic kit because they were no. separated. There were three no. individual stripes. But um, we talk that, about that is an original. I think that is from '94, and that is the maybe like one of the probably like the third or fourth Celtic thing that I ever had. I got the '88 top when I was eight, and then. I would I think I got a couple more top home tops between then and then I got the this and then I had it's got shorts to go with it. They were kind of longer shorts, they're more almost like the same, like almost like cycle shorts, like kind of they weren't tight like cycle shorts, but they were they were they were um 
the same length going down. And then it's on, on the back, it's got the Umbro badge in the back. Yeah, and proper weirdly 90s. It's got, weirdly, has got Umbro on both sleeves. So it's, it's a bit of a wild design, really, all in. Um, but back then, but, it was all about over-branding everything, eh? Just stick the logo everywhere. Big, massive yeah. Umbro on the back. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, it is unfortunate. But, you know, but as I was saying, I have mentioned the fact that there is, um, obviously, a wee bit of interest in the book from Adidas because their nine kits are in there. Um, there is a, a rumour that there's going to be a tenth kit re being released very, very soon this season. What? So keep That's your, keep your eyes peeled. For, uh, yeah, I know. I know. Keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and if they do want to speak to us, as has been suggested about uh, future concepts, get in touch because obviously we have got a lot of people making uh, comments in the in the comment section every day, and I'm pretty sure there will be loads of great ideas. There's some brilliantly creative people out there. K Matsu says that's a nice shirt. I agree with you. Yes, taking me back to the 1990s. And um, Sean Barlow, how good was half time in the first 15 minutes of the second for atmosphere? It was just tremendous. Uh, Joe, the question is, do they have a penny to ah. drop? <laughs> nice one, Joe. I always um, talking about the penny arcade, so I don't know. Oh, by the way, that's another story because obviously I think someone was up to the old mischief at the weekend because that song was played as soon as we were um, Spotify playlist ended. Somebody put on the penny arcade across the big speakers at the venue where we were just interviewing Martin O'Neill. Uh, you, you obviously never heard it. I somebody no. played it. We <laughs> very quickly got into the room and, and uh, put that right. K Matsu, they're coming to terms with reality. It is a necessary process, 100%. People are getting bogged down with figures, 117 plays, 114 and all this kind of stuff. Right, that's fine. Let's have a wee chat about someone who was born today, uh, 83 years ago, the one, the only, uh, the dearly missed Billy McNeil. What about this for a trophy hall, JP, right? Now, pay attention to the numbers because I love this. One European Cup, nine leagues, Six League Cups, seven Scottish Cups, 1967. Superb, 1967. Now, 23 titles he won in terms of trophies um, at Celtic. And that was at the time where we're competing for the Drybra Cup, the Glasgow Cup, etc., etc., et and they're not counted. So 23 trophies. Callum McGregor won his 17th JP on Sunday. So he's only six behind Big Billy. <laughs> Caesar, that that's and, astonishing, isn't it? And, and did you see the clip of what he said to the the Hamden official? I did. Have you seen that? Right, I've done this before, mate. <laughs> I seen him saying something, and I'm like, I couldn't figure out what it was, and I knew that someone would come up with it on Twitter, and they did. And I'm just I've thinking, done this wow. before, mate. That is absolutely <laughs> amazing, chat. I, I love that. Like, it was, it was a kind of like assured, not arrogance, just like I, I I've been here before. We, we've done this. You know, we, but it's an assuredness. Time. You're right. It's an assuredness yeah. that we've been here. We know how to deal with a situation. Not only that, mm. we know how to conduct ourselves as well, both before and after. And by the way, how well does it that Kyogo scored in both goals in the League Cup final against Hibs and both goals in the League Cup final against against them? I, I, <laughs> I mean, he is. By far and away, that interview he did afterwards where he speaks in English, I, I, I've watched that quite a few times now and I, I absolutely love it because, you know, beforehand you've not really had any real insight into, I mean, you've, you've had insight into his character with his gestures and his enthusiasm and his celebrations and everything else, but to actually hear him speak from the heart and say what he wants to say in English, you know, properly for the first time, you're it's just brilliant. And the thing is as well, and I said this uh, the other day, I was like, that's going to make him a better player as, as a result. Because mm -hmm. if he's able to communicate better with his players, teammates, and understand better what they're what they are saying, if everyone yeah. is by and large speaking in English, then mm -hmm. there's probably more levels to his game, which is frightening for for the opposition in, in Scotland and hopefully in, in Europe as well. I mean, I, I really, really hope that, you know, there's been a few people saying, oh, he'll be away in the summer or people are, and Kev said yesterday that he was, he was speaking to a Liverpool podcast or something and they were saying, 
that they were aware of Kyogo and he's always getting mentioned now, like, oh, who's scored for Celtic? Oh, it's Kyogo. It's Co- of course it's Kyogo. He scored, yeah. scores every week. So that's mildly concerning. What I think he needs to do it on a, on a bigger stage before we really need to get worried about, about losing him. Yeah, the, the, somebody said to me over the weekend, and I wish I knew who it was, so apologies that I'm not giving you credit, that he can score a goal without seemingly kicking the ball. Now, I know what they meant. See the two goals. It's almost as if the the ball, the ball slightly changes direction, but he has obviously made contact, but he's so fleet-footed, uh, JP, so quick with his movement that the ball's in the net before you've even realised that he's touched it. And he scored a lot of goals like that for Celtic. And I've heard a lot of people talking about, because people love the figures, he's going for 30 goals this season. You know what? He, he could maybe even get 35. We've potentially got to think, what is it, 15 games to go? Mm-hmm. And he's on 24 goals at the moment. That, that that's astonishing, right? Because if you hit that wee purple patch, you get a couple of doubles, a couple of maybe way, a hat trick, you know. That picture of him leaping up and celebrating, doing the kind of punch midair. Have you seen it? You must have seen it. It's all over. All yeah. that is an absolute belter. And speaking of pictures as well, a guy I know, Ryan Johnston. Um, if you haven't seen his pictures, look up Ryan Johnston on on, uh, on Twitter. He, he's he, he's a photographer. That's his job. And he takes pictures at gigs. Like I, I always see him posting you know, pictures from from the gigs that he works. And he's worked small gigs, huge gigs, all sorts. But I've never seen him posting football pictures before. Sunday was the first day that I'd seen him. He was like, "Congrat!" I think he is a Celtic fan. Congratulations to to Celtic FC on their victory. And he put he posted four pictures. There was one of Maeda just sort of celebrating with his jacket on, obviously because he's he was subbed. Uh, celebrating like that. There's one, a really, really great one, a Jota celebrating with the fans behind them. Mm-hmm. There's a great pick of the players all in the corner with the the, the sort of banner, the, the League Cup banner and the trophy. And then he's got a, a dynamite one of the huddle as well with the kind of, with the smoke all around about it. it it's they're really, really good. I'm going to back check them out. Them up. I'm going to bam them up, see if I can get one, like, like a... Get the prints. Uh, a copy one, yeah. yeah. Ah, like, but you mentioned about the last thing that we're going to have to talk about on this show. You mentioned Jota. What about the song Jota on the Wing, the acoustic version? JP, it is I, tremendous. It's I, brilliant. I don't really know how. I've not. I've not figured out the origin of it. Or I know that it's a girl Ellie Dixon. Yeah. And I know that it was on Patrick Keelty's show. Mm-hmm. Was it simply the case that she asked for? suggestions of fan songs and someone i.e. a Celtic fan sent that in as a suggestion and then she went all right I'll do that because I she's English I don't know if she has any connection to Celtic I mean obviously she could have a Scottish dad who's obsessed with Celtic or something like that I mean there's every chance that something loose like that like, but that's right like the girl at the quarry what was her name again Michelle was it Michelle Keegan or McKeegan or something Michelle Keegan. She uh, she's a Celtic fan because her old, her granddad was a Celtic fan from oh, Glasgow. I did know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Could be something well, like that. I'd like to know the origin. I've seen Big Bems has kind of chimed in and tried to get a collaboration on the go. <laughs> I know. Where were you for the collab when we done the Glory in the Dream, Big Man? Um, yeah. I cont- as you do, I contacted our manager. So um, we are waiting on a response. We have had a, a response from the manager saying, listen, we'll come back to you on that to see if she wants to do an unplugged session with a Celtic state of mind. So that would be absolutely tremendous. And obviously, I, was, I, assume, she's, I assume she's getting a bit of a game. If she was on Patrick Keelty's show, mm. she must be getting a bit of a game for her own music and not just covering a random uh, Eastern European song that's been adopted by <laughs> Celtic fans. Um because the, the originals uh, is the original is it Belarusian or I, I can't let I can't it even, is I can't Kevin tell Graham you. Kevin Graham done a, an article on it recently uh, for right. something that that will uh, be out there very very soon but yeah he wrote at depth in depth about it he'll be thinking that he was ahead of the curve but he was actually ahead of the curve on it mm. and um, Ellie's come in and taking all the all the praise but I've noticed that she's disabled comments on the YouTube probably for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, hopefully we can get her on the show, JP. And you know what? We can maybe just put it out on a Thursday along with you and me talking about it because yeah. people love a wee bit of music on a Thursday. It's been a very, very quick hour and five minutes. Loads to talk about. And we probably spoke about uh, three or four of the points that we planned to talk about. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. 
in the comments as always it's all about positivity here on a Celtic state of mind if you want to help us out give us a thumbs up on the video if you want to come along and see us with Alan Thompson which is the next available event that we have coming up then the ticket link is underneath the video all that's left for me to say on this Thursday afternoon is thank you once again JP Mason for joining me on a Celtic state